Hey everyone, and welcome to the Sensor Plane Photography Podcast, where light and technology come together. I'm your host, Jason O'Dell, and today I've got a bunch of topics. I know I've been gone for a while. I've been doing a lot of workshops. I've been out in the field taking pictures, which is always better than sitting in front of the camera. But I thought I'd bring you up to speed. So um, it's now August of 2015, and my workshop schedule is mostly through. I've got a few more coming up, but I just wanted to fill you in. Back in June, I was in Badlands National Park with my partner, Deborah Sandage, and we had an amazing time. A small group workshop, eight photographers, two instructors, and we got up really early and uh, stayed up really late, but we made some amazing pictures. The light in the Badlands was just incredible. So um, I'm looking at possible dates for next year for the Badlands, so if you want to check that out, uh, go out to my YouTube page. There's a free webinar about the Badlands on there, and you can uh, see that for yourself. I also just got back from my Colorado wildflower trip with Rick Walker, formerly of the Image Doctors, and we led that near Crested Butte. And this has been a tremendous year for wildflowers here in Colorado, where we've been getting just tremendous amounts of rain this year. The flowers were everywhere. It was spectacular. It was gorgeous. We had all kinds of wonderful light to work with. We shot macro, close-up landscapes. We had everything, beautiful sunrises. It was a fantastic trip. So I'm considering going back there next year. If you're interested in a trip like that to Colorado, let me know. Drop me a note on my website, luminescentphoto.com. In a couple weeks, I'll be heading out to Chicago to do a visual artistic workshop, a creative digital workshop with Deborah Sandage, where we explore the architecture and the art around the city of Chicago and downtown. It's just gorgeous. The skyline, the fountains, the bean. Uh, it's going to be amazing. That one's sold out. Uh, but if that's your type of workshop where you can have a small group, uh, two instructors, and learn artistic vision techniques, then check out an upcoming workshop I have in October in Miami. We're going to South Beach, and it's going to be great. We have a few spots open, but you have to RSVP by August 13th if you want to get our discounted hotel rate. Anyway, other news coming up. Uh, just the other day, Nikon announced three new Nikkor lenses, 24-1-8, 24-70, 2.8E, ED VR, so we're getting VR in that, and then a new one, a 200 to 500 f5.6 VR. Now, I just posted on the blog at luminescentphoto.com my in-depth take on these lenses, whether you should get them, posted the MTF charts and some specs, but let me just give you the quick rundown here. Um, the 2418, how do I see that? I think this is amazing. Um, it It's a uh, smaller lighter lens than the 24 1.4. Now keep in mind, the 24 1.4 is a $2,000 lens. Uh, it's very good. It's sort of the go-to lens if you're interested in doing things like uh, wide angle night sky photography. The 1.8 version though is almost as good. If you look at the MTF charts on out on my blog, you're gonna see that they look awfully similar. Now these are wide open. Why would you want this lens? Well, really two reasons why you want a lens like this. Um, in the past, we looked at fast prime lenses for low light photography, and that still holds true. Prime lenses are usually very sharp. They're well corrected. They don't have to worry about zooming, moving parts and things like that. So you get a good quality piece of glass when you buy a prime lens, especially when you buy one from the manufacturer. Up until now, Nikon has been slowly adding in 1.8 lenses to go with their, some consider legendary, 1.4 lenses. Well, the 1.8s have some real advantages to them, though. They're, they're smaller, they're lighter, and they're a lot less expensive. Now, you might want this for fast, low-light work, but you also probably want a lens like this to get shallow depth of field. Keep in mind that with today's digital cameras, you know, whether you have a, uh, you know, from any manufacturer, you're getting pretty decent low light performance. That means you can use ISO 1600 or higher with really no problem. You add in things like image stabilization systems, Nikon's VR, Canon's IS, and you've got a pretty good hand-holdable indoor lens. 
These fast primes make your shutter speeds higher indoors, but they give you a creative element that you just cannot get from a kit lens, and that is that shallow depth of field, especially with wide angle lenses. Also, because they gather more light, they're gonna be great choices if you wanna do outdoor night sky landscapes. Things like stars, the Milky Way, stuff like that. The faster the lens, the more light it can get and you can capture those faint clouds of the Milky Way. So this 24 1.8, it's under $800. If it's something that you are thinking about getting the f1.4, I would jump on this lens. You can pre-order it. There's a link on my site where you can find the link to pre-order that. Um, if it's something that would go in your bag, it's less than a third of the price. It is just about half the weight of the 1.4 version, and I think most people are going to be very happy with that, as they would be with all of the 1.8 Nikon lenses, the 20, now the 24, the 28, the 35, the 50, and the 85. That's a huge lineup of fast primes that will not break your budget if that's what you're looking to do. The, the other new lens that Nikon came out with, completely new, 200 to 500 f 5.6 E VR. Whoa, okay, so that's a super telephoto zoom. It's the first lens that Nikon's had that's longer than their 80 to 400 or 200 to 400 that doesn't cost $8,000. The 500 f4 is a wonderful lens, but it's an $8,000 lens. This 200 to 500. Uh, it's a little slower. It's at 5.6, uh, but it has some new features. It's not only got the four stops of VR reduction, but it's got the E designation, meaning it has the electronically controlled diaphragm. What does that mean? Well, those little aperture blades that go in and out when you change your f-stop, in older Nikon lenses up until now, they've been controlled by a little mechanical linkage. This E lens, and there's a few of them that have just been recently announced, means that the aperture blades are controlled electronically. Now, the benefit of this is, in theory, you're going to get better exposure control because there's no moving uh, levers when you shoot in high speed. So if you're shooting sports or wildlife where you need fast burst speeds, I've seen sometimes where exposure can vary a little bit from shot to shot. And that's simply because the aperture blades probably aren't stopping down exactly the same way from from every shot. This should correct that. But more importantly, you have to keep in mind that it's only going to work on the newer camera. So if you've got an old Nikon camera, you want to check to make sure that this particular aperture control is supported uh, by the lens mount. This lens, though, is amazing for one reason, and that is its price. It comes in with a list price of about $1,400 US. Whoa, that's incredible because the 80 to 400 VR that just was released a few years ago, just was updated a couple of years ago, that's a 24 to $2,500 lens. Here's a design that's not going to break your bank. It's going to get you to 500 millimeters, okay? And that's going to be perfect if you are a birder or wildlife photographer. On the downside, it's still a five pound lens. That's heavy. You can handhold this, but not for extended periods of time. You're going to get tired doing that. You're going to want to put this lens on a tripod or a monopod if you're going to use it. Um, maximum aperture 5.6, that means it's going to autofocus just fine. And if you have a newer Nikon body, you could use it with the new TC14E3, which puts you at f8, but you'd still be able to use some of the autofocus points. So if you've got a D4, a D800, a D750, you're going to be able to focus not as fast, but with a teleconverter on this lens. So at that price, if you're looking for a birding or a wildlife lens, I would just put in my pre-order for this sucker now. I feel like it's going to be a great deal. The last one of the bunch is the 24 to 70 E VR. So 24 to 70. I own mine. It's been out since 2007. It is my most used lens. I love it. I, it's a fantastic lens. It's sharp. It, it produces excellent contrast. Uh, it's wonderful for landscapes. It's wonderful for hand holding. Uh, if you're a wedding photographer, photojournalist, it's probably in your bag because it's just that good. This new one, finally, some would say, adds VR. It also improves the optical design. It adds the uh, electronic aperture control uh, as well as VR. So now you get four stops of VR um, 
and you're getting a sharper lens. I've Again, the MTF charts are on my website, luminescentphoto.com. So what, what's different about this? Should you consider it? Well, I think personally, um, let, me, let me step back for a second. When they design this lens, the new design, it's bigger, it's heavier, and it uses a larger filter size than its predecessor. And depending on what kind of shooting you do, that may or may not be a problem. Um, if you are a wedding photographer, you shoot mostly in, so inside shots, handheld, no filters. I say, this is what you want to do. Get this lens. Upgrade. It, it definitely want to be on your list. On the other hand, if you are like me or you shoot outdoors on a tripod landscapes, there's some things to consider. The lens is about an inch taller, so it's six inches tall instead of five, so it's a little bit taller to pack. It's a, about a half pound heavier. That's not insignificant when you're packing on a trip. And it uses an 82 millimeter filter. So gone now are the days where you could have something like a 16 to 35 or a 17 to 35, a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200, all in your Trinity, all using the same filter thread. Again, if you don't use a lot of filters, not a problem at all, it's a no brainer. But if you have to go out and buy 82 millimeter filters, they are not inexpensive. For example, the Nikon polarizing filter, it's about $160 at B&H. So that's expensive. And then if you do stuff like I like, which is like long exposure photography, uh, maybe you need to get uh, a very ND, those Singray filters, you're looking at another five or $600, maybe even more, depending on which filters you have, because now your 77 millimeter filter isn't gonna work. You can't use it with an adapter, you can't step it up. So that's something to keep in mind. I think it's going to be an awesome lens, but I think if you've already got the 24-70 to 70 and you don't shoot events or weddings, you might want to hold off on that uh, simply because of the, the uh, ramifications of the larger size and the larger filter. Okay, another new update, this time on the software side, and that's Lightroom CC slash Lightroom 6. Now, um, this came out earlier in the year. Um, Lightroom 6 is the version if you buy it in the box edition. Lightroom Creative Cloud is if you buy it through the online subscription. And a couple of points on Lightroom 6. People ask me this all the time, you know, should, should, you, should you subscribe to this? Um, at this point, the differences between uh, Photoshop and Lightroom, um, Adobe Creative Suite CS6, and Photoshop C CC 2015, Lightroom CC 2015, the differences are great enough that if you were, weren't sure about upgrading, you, you might want to consider it. And part of the reason is that not only do you get these new features, but you get updates more frequently than you would if you bought the box software. In fact, there are some updates in Lightroom Creative Cloud version that aren't available in Lightroom 6. There are a couple of new features in Creative Cloud that you would want to consider. And, and here's the thing. At this point, um, Adobe offers the photography package, which includes Photoshop, full version, Lightroom, full version, and a few, and a few other things, for $9.99 per month. So that's $10. That's two Starbucks coffees. That's not a lot of money. Okay, so yes, you are paying for a subscription. Keep in mind, however, you're downloading the software. It runs standalone on your computer. There is no internet connection required to get the software to function. It just has to register. So if you're concerned about not being able to use your software because you're somewhere without internet access, that's an, a, a, a non-issue, okay? The, the two major features um, in Lightroom CC in the latest version are HDR and pano stitching and a new slider called Dehaze. Now, I've talked about the HDR pano stitching in the past. In fact, I've got a video tutorial available in my shop on how to do HDR with Lightroom. It's actually really good, especially if you're doing landscape photography and you want to blend uh, and make natural looking HDR images. You can also blend panos in Lightroom 6 CC. And the advantage of doing this here is one of workflow. When you create an HDR, 
or a panoramic stitch directly in Lightroom, Lightroom produces a raw file in Adobe's DNG format. Now, I don't use DNG format for my normal images, but it's fine in this particular case. This RAW file will preserve all of your in-camera adjustments that you can change. Things like camera calibration, lens corrections, all of that. And you don't need to save a TIFF file. You also don't need to worry about pre-processing your images to create those TIFF files. So if you want to change the sharpening or change the distortion or change the white balance, you are working on an HDR or a panoramic image as if it came out of the camera like a RAW file. That is really cool. So it's worth it for that feature. The new feature is something called Dehaze. And I want to take you over to my computer and show you how the Dehaze slider works in Lightroom CC 2015. Okay, I'm in Lightroom 6 now. And uh, I'm working in the develop module on a stitched pan. Now, like I mentioned, this is one of the features that you can do in Lightroom CC, Lightroom 6. I've stitched together three images into a panoramic image. But this is very cool because in the develop module, this image behaves just as any Nikon, in this case, RAW file works, or Nikon Canon, any, any program. The image is stored in DNG format, and so I can go and change the uh, camera calibration settings to whatever I want. I can change exposure. I work on this image as if it were a normal RAW file. So that's really great for both HDR and panos because it's an improvement to my workflow. I no longer need to batch out TIFFs, merge things, and then redo it if I for some reason mess up. I can go and change any of these settings, sharpening, whatever. But the other cool slider that was added to Lightroom CC in a update was something called the dehaze slider. And if we look at the dehaze slider, it is in the effects panel down here at the bottom. And dehaze is similar to clarity, but it's a differently applied algorithm. It's a different effect. So I can crank up the dehaze and you'll see that it really adds some punch to my landscape shot here gets rid of that hazy look. I can also go in the negative direction with dehaze. See that? And it makes it look like I got fog in the image. So that's kind of cool. But one of the things I wanted to show you was how you can use dehaze in a night sky Milky Way image. So if we pull up this image here and I go back into my effects panel, Here's the Milky Way. I've done some basic adjustments to this in Lightroom already. I've, I've adjusted whites and, and shadows and contrast. But sometimes the Milky Way just doesn't stand out. If I use the dehaze slider, just add it in there. Look at that. That Milky Way just really pops out now. And I get a nice dark sky with that punch. I find this works tremendously well for my night sky images. So check it out if you've got Lightroom CC. OK, so that's pretty cool, that dehaze slider in Lightroom CC. Uh, again, if you aren't subscribing, this is probably the chance to, to start looking at that. Because again, for $10 a month US, I really can't complain with that. You get both of those products, and they get frequently updated. The last thing I want to touch on before I head out for, for this episode is night sky photography. And in the summertime, you can go out. It gets dark kind of late. Um, I love photographing into the blue hour, but what about when it gets dark? The coolest thing about digital cameras is that you can crank up the ISO now and get star shots that are amazing. You get stars that aren't star trails. Now you've seen star trail pictures, they're cool too. And when film, you pretty much had to shoot star trails because the only way to get an exposure that would capture the, the light from the stars was to do uh, bulb exposures, leave your camera shutter open for you know several minutes. So you'd get star trails and that's great. I love star trails, they're really cool. But with digital cameras, you can also capture just regular landscape shots illuminated maybe by the moon or light painting, and you get the stars above you. And 
the darker it gets, the more stars you can see. And again, going back to those fast lenses I talked about earlier, if you have a fast lens, you can get shots of the Milky Way. Now, setting all that stuff up is something that I've been working on for a long time. And so I released a new ebook a few weeks ago called The Night Sky Photography Handbook. And in this book, it not only talks about the cameras and the gear, but how to find the Milky Way, how to set up your shot, and how to post-process your images using techniques that I've shown you in Lightroom and in other products like Photoshop to really make amazing landscape images. It's available from my website, and it's also on the iBook store if you have um, an Apple iPad. Uh, just check it out at luminescentphoto.com and click on the, the Books tab, and you'll see it right there. So until next time, I appreciate you all watching. Stay tuned for the next episode of the Sensor Plane Podcast. Check out my blog, luminescentphoto.com. I'm Jason O'Dell. See you soon.